Well, welcome, and thank you all for coming on a time just before the 4th of July weekend. Appreciate your taking the time to be here, and people who are on the internet as well. So I'm Tom Stossel. I am a uh, visiting scholar here at AEI. I am also a physician who devoted most of his career to medical research. I happily had 45 years of unbroken uh, research funding from the government, the NIH, and then had the temerity to uh, uh -oh. to try to use technology. <laughs> <laughs> temerity to use technology, right? There we go. There we to pen this uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal earlier this year. Uh, this scored me a rebuke from uh, former speaker Newt Gingrich and a letter to the editor from two Nobel Prize winners declaring me astonishingly ignorant about innovation and research, which may be true. That would have been the end of it had it not been then that the administration, current administration, uh, proposed a very cheap budget for the National Institutes of Health, which of course is the major source of biomedical research funding from the government, uh, and I thought we should have a conversation. So I'm really pleased that these panelists agreed to have that conversation and are here. And the, so the game plan will be, I'm going to do a very brief introduction about innovation in general, and then the panelists will say their pieces briefly, then we'll have a discussion among the panel, and then we'll open it up to you guys uh, for uh, discussion. And lest I forget, after the event, there will be a reception here, uh, wine and cheese. That'll be the best part. So I benchmark innovation in medicine to three eras. <laughs> from the beginning of recorded history till the middle of the 19th century, and that's easy. There was nothing. Then, after that, for the next 100 years, there was a lot, uh, illustrated in some of the topics on, on, on this slide. The era we're in now started after the Second World War, and I call it the GABC, the Government Academic Biomedical Complex. This was a very large increase in government support of biomedical research, primarily through the NIH. It led to the construction of what I think is probably the biggest research institute in the world up the road here in Bethesda, Maryland, and the awarding of grants to universities and research institutes that uh, in turn markedly ramped up their faculties and their facilities. Now, has there been innovation during the GABC era. You're darn right there has been. When I started out in medicine 50 years ago, cardiovascular mortality, which is the number one killer, was at its peak. It's come down 60%. Now, of course, the death rate remains one per person. So you don't die of the number one cause. Statistically, you go in the number two category, that's cancer. But cancer mortality, has been flat and is currently at an all-time low. Few of you look like you're old enough to remember the emergence of the HIV AIDS epidemic and the apocalyptic threats that it was going to bankrupt the healthcare system. Never soon enough, but in short order, it went away. We got it under control. When I started out in medicine, we used to see people crippled up with arthritis, in pain, in wheelchairs, in uh, st uh, relegated to bed and chair. Now, thanks to great drugs, it's a very sensitive. Boy, this thing is or tough. Or I'm very, tough. I'm a it's terrible klutz at making it run here. Thanks to great drugs and devices, you rarely see that, <laughs> and we live longer. So the number of old geezers like me, over 65 years old, has increased exponentially. That, though, brings us to a disconnect, which is if we engraft 
the government funding, the GABC, on this curve, we see that the curves ran in parallel until about the 80s, then they diverged, and we have a gap that is widening. Now, this is a great segue to the, the first panelist, Mary Woolley. Nobody has been more passionate over the past 30 years that she's directed as CEO Research America for trying to do something about this curve. And so, Mary, I'm going Thank to you, pass it over to you. Okay. I hope you have better so, luck with it than yeah, I Yeah, we'll, we'll see here. So going back. So, yes, Mary Woolley. So in full disclosure, like Tom, I've been a recipient of NIH funding. Um, I spent a decade uh, with what was then the largest ever NIH-funded clinical trial, the Mr. Fit Project, so-called, in the 1970s. And after that, uh, was the CEO of an independent research institute in San Francisco. So in those days, too, uh, part of my salary came from the NIH, but also from other supporters of research, including, remember, it was San Francisco, HIV AIDS research in the 1980s. And it was a desperate and disturbing time, but also it became, became a very exciting time for science. After that, um, as Tom has alluded to, I became the CEO of Research America. And at this point, I don't get a dollar of NIH funding. But I am, since we're talking about NIH, I, I am a, a life, a career long um, uh, advocate for NIH and for the rest of the research and innovation enterprise. Our mission at Research America, you can see here, is to, to make the improvement of health, um, research to improve health, a higher national priority. It takes a lot of forms. Our work takes a lot of forms, but this is our goal. Uh, we're, our composition is revealing of the entire ecosystem that uh, we are concerned about. So, because we're engaged with patient groups who are members of ours, academia, independent research institutes, my own background, industry, philanthropy, and scientific societies, we really cover the waterfront of the stakeholder community, if you will, when it comes to medical and health research. And just about everything we do is calculated with the, listening to the voice of the needs of the um, concerns and the promise of each of those groups and what they can add to the conversation and ultimately to discovery and development and ultimately delivery of better health care. We have a fantastic board that also represents those sectors, if you will, as well as distinguished former members of Congress. Now, I think it's useful to just take a look at a snapshot about who's, where medical and research, uh, medical and health research is being conducted, in what sectors. People sometimes think that it's all the federal government. That is not true at all. Um, hasn't been true for quite some time. Uh, but you can just see here displayed that the lion's share, it's industry for sure. We're talking about pharma, bio, medical device, uh, industry and the federal government and overwhelmingly the NIH, but not only the NIH in that component. And then the university's own money, there's no double counting here, and you can read the rest. Now, that's a lot of money, $158 billion a year, but compared to what? So when you think about the total cost of health, health care spending, you can see that it's only about 5% of that total that has been committed to investing in the future, a better future of health. That hasn't budged as a percentage for quite some time, although the total, the total pie there has grown. Uh, so it's both good and bad news. As we all know, the cost of health care is out of control. Um, but the proportion of research that we're spending on trying to get a better handle on that is not growing proportionally. So I think it's not surprising, you may disagree, but I think it's not surprising that we find through polls, that we, surveys that we commission, and that's just a piece of our work. We regularly commission public opinion surveys to find out whether the research enterprise, if you will, that's what we'd call it maybe in this room, 
is connecting to the public and serving the public's interest. Because if it doesn't serve the public's interest, it's not going to continue to exist. Nothing ever does. It was Abraham Lincoln who said, public sentiment is everything. Without it, nothing can succeed. But with it, nothing can fail. So we keep a finger on the pulse of public sentiment. So here you see that people don't think we're spending enough on the future, if you will, of uh, health. Um, famously summed up by one of the founders of Research America, Mary Lasker. So we are talking in these days uh, because we're in conversations in, in the level of the Congress and the administration about plussing up our defense capability. I'm not, we're not, none of us are here to talk about whether it's a good or a bad idea, but it's, it's happening, it's gonna happen. We are not talking about, in the Congress and the administration, plussing up our so-called health security via more support for the NIH. And you can extend it beyond the NIH to other players, important, critical partners in health research. But this is a pretty startling difference of commitment of our tax dollars. It is worth thinking about, I think, that it's important to defend our nation, but let's have a nation worth defending and a lot of different measures thereof. Um, I think Research America says that federally funded research is a public good. It has to prove that it is a public good. That's really important. These aren't just words. It really has to be engaged with the public. Uh, and it's an investment that's had numerous payout, payoffs in many different ways. And it's important to Americans. And one of the acid tests of that is would Americans pay more in taxes to support it if asked, which they're not being asked to right now, by the way. But the answer is yes. And we've tracked this over several decades now. Uh, it comes out about the same year after year after year that about 50% of Americans say yes, they'd pay more in taxes. Because they really believe in the importance of research for health. They, well, there's, I could show you tons and tons of data, I'm not going to, but a few other keys, key things is another piece of data that's held up robustly over decades is support for basic science. This, it's often thought that uh, people are much more interested in applied sciences closer to being realized in your life, in, whether it's in a product or a, a medication or whatever. But it's also true that the American public overall um, agrees that basic science is important too and it's, it's a role of the government to fund it. This, by the way, does not say medical and health research. This is basic science, generally. So now a little bad news. Um, actually, people don't think we're making enough progress in developing new medicines. And I hope we're gonna talk a bit about that. How's that gonna happen? By sticking with status quo uh, right now, today, solutions going forward, or are we gonna change things up to try to drive progress? That's clearly what the, what the public is looking for, and I'm sure it's true for each and every one of us, whether it's our own health, somebody in our family. We want answers, we want solutions to what ails us. Next one. It's more, um, less than wonderful news. Science is pretty much invisible in this country. For all we might think that everybody knows what the science community is doing and who we are, et cetera. This is about science broadly, you'll notice again. Can you name a living scientist? This, the percentage who can hasn't budged for decades. Sometimes the names change. This is the first time this year that we've seen this curious category of 2% saying me, <laughs> you know, which is uh, almost impossible statistically. You know, so there may be a little tongue-in-cheekness here, but I think it's great if more people think that they're scientists. And you can be a, all different kinds of scientists. You know, science of life, you're a scientist. But anyway, this is not a high percentage. It's not, not a good sign. This one is in many ways worse, although the percentage is higher who can name it. This is not a hard question. This is about medical and health research specifically. Can you name an institution, company, or organization where research is conducted? Only one third of Americans say yes, and this is what they say when they say yes. Um, and there are people that are, you know, tongue-tied 
after they say, yeah, I can do that, and then turn out not to be able to do that. But for those who can say something, here's what they say, just to think about. And then finally, worst, worst, worst of all, to the best of your knowledge, would you say that medical research in the US is conducted in all 50 states? To which the correct answer is yes. Uh, only 28% of the public seem to know that. This in itself explains a lot of the reality that there are many members of Congress who never talk about medical research. They're not hearing about it when they go home to their district and state. They don't have a sense of its importance in their district and state, and they may not even know that it's being conducted there. We haven't tested that, but you know, it's unlike, they probably do know. But the public generally don't know. That's a problem. And yet they want it to succeed, they support it conceptually. They also want the science community, and this is where it comes to, to all of us in the science community, to do a better job connecting to the public to serving the public's interest in a very explicit way that is a conversation rather than a, trust me, I'm on my way to getting the Nobel Prize and you'll benefit eventually, but actually to bringing the public in. And I'd say right from the beginning at that, um, the, a, a group of distinguished leaders in research, including two former directors of the NIH, put together this, it's a small booklet, just before um, the election. Um, it's not clear that the recommendations are going to be implemented, but this was the first time that a recommendation like the one here exists, has existed in a, this type of publication. Um, and it's about helping the science community become fluent in the public context of science, understanding uh, the context that we all live and work in. I think it's very exciting. Another thing that I hope will come to fruition rather than just be an idea is a concept for a Blue Ribbon Commission that the Congress would put in place uh, to engage in a deeper, more meaningful way with the American public and, and ultimately form a strategic direction going forward for putting science to work. And this is broader science, by the way, but it would include medical and health research. And another way of saying the same thing is a slogan that's often repeated, it, it originated with the South African disability movement, uh, nothing about us without us. Engage the people who ultimately stand to benefit want medical progress to move faster. Let's bring them in. And that's why we say at Research America that the most important four words a researcher can say and convey are, I work for you. I work for you. And mean it and engage in a conversation about how to work as a partnership to forward research. And that's Research America, we work for you. That's how we always finish up. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Mary. Now, we're not in order, so if we can pass this down to Jeff. Okay. Um, thank you for that very eloquent uh, um, articulation of uh, the need and the, pu the public uh, face. Um, so we now transition from the political to the practical. And the, the panelist is Jeff Flyer, who's recently retired as dean of the Harvard Medical School, where for almost a decade he was uh, deep in the spreadsheets uh, trying to actually make a research operation work. And uh, I think it's very important to get his perspective on how that, uh, how that operates. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Tom, and thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I guess in the spirit of Mary's full disclosure, so I trained at NIH after I did my medical training for four years. Uh, I came to Boston. I had a career where I was pretty much continuously funded by NIH for all the research that I did. I ran a school that, depending on which way you parse the school, if it, you take the narrow view of what the school was, uh, the people employed by Harvard, uh, we had well over $200 million a year due today uh, of uh, NIH funding. If you added up the school plus the rest of the faculty that are in all of our affiliated hospitals, it's way over a billion dollars a year. So we're talking serious money to support serious activity, uh, and we are like many other places, although we're a little bigger than many others. 
Um, so what I want to do is, with that background, and uh, just say a little bit about where are we today from the perspective of someone who was responsible for trying to run a research uh, enterprise. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying that the stability and sustainability of the academic bioscience enterprise, I believe, is challenged. The premise is, uh, uh, if you go and you walk the halls of Harvard Medical School and the hospitals in Boston and many other places, uh, people are really worried. They're concerned that the future uh, path for their careers and their institutions may not be uh, what they thought it was a few years earlier. Uh, and I believe it's worth taking steps to fix and strengthen this system as well as enhance the view of uh, how good it is to be a biomedical researcher. Um, a key symptom of the problem is what I would say is an increasing mismatch between the size, scope, and the model of the current ecosystem uh, built over many decades and the sources of revenue that are now available to support it. It's as simple as that when you look at it as an accounting matter of school budgets and hospital budgets. Uh, the size, scope, and the model of the research ecosystem didn't get dropped down from heaven. Uh, it uh, really reflected the funding opportunities that uh, came to be, past, current, and also expected future levels and models for deploying very large amounts of money, uh, at least for researchers, nothing like the defense budget, but big. Uh, and this is also influenced by the fact that whereas maybe 100 years ago, there weren't that many hospitals and medical schools, and they didn't view research as a core part of what they did. There wasn't much to do research about. They didn't have the tools. Uh, but now, uh, medical schools and uh, hospitals are uh, very aware of the fact that part of their mission is to generate new knowledge and to change the uh, future of medicine. And it also becomes a matter of competitive landscape. If you want to have the best students, you want to have the best faculty, uh, you better be doing research. And you also want donors uh, and patients to be aware of the research that you do, whether that's material or not to your daily care as a patient. So what is this ecosystem? I'm just going to give you a quick uh, walkthrough of it. So uh, the blue circle is the academic health centers, universities, and research institutes all across the land in every state. And within that uh, circle, you've got the faculty and trainees, the people who are actually uh, doing this for their careers. Uh, the sources of money are numerous. You saw them broken down a few moments ago, but you know NIH is the largest for the academic bioscience research system. There's also money from philanthropy, endowment, uh, which came from philanthropy, industry. And it used to be, and still to some small degree, that there was a very large excess of uh, revenues that hospitals had that came from clinical activities that just generated a lot of money, more than they needed to give back to the salaries of the people who were doing the work. Uh, so that allowed there to be a transfer of funds from the clinical side, and a lot of that in major institutions supported research. Why do people go there to do this work? Well, uh, the goal is to generate new knowledge. This, of course, gets mediated through publications that then help create career success and satisfaction. They're required for competitive funding to show what you can do. And then on the left, with a couple of arrows, probably not big enough for Tom, but uh, the goal is that that new knowledge will eventually, some of it, not all of it, will uh, be necessary for the most important new therapies. Because we don't actually know enough for most of our diseases to be properly treated or prevented. We need to know things, and we don't exactly know what we don't know. OK, so what determines the size and shape of the ecosystem? It's the funding. Uh, I can promise you that. And then what are the key determinants of the quality, efficacy, and impact of the work? Well, it's the nature of the incentives that we set up for the scientists and for the institutions. And they're both academic and financial. We can talk about them some more later. I don't believe there is a right size that someone can just think and say, this is how much research we need to do. There is no such thing as that. It comes out of all of these sources, and that leads to an ecosystem that has grown. Uh, but it may not continue to grow. Uh, everybody who's in the game wants more support. That's natural in every field. Uh, but uh, the financial sources in the future are uncertain. And I believe we're going to have to have some changes in the system. Either they'll happen by natural uh, selection, or they'll happen through some element of planning. Uh, and I just broke down here my sense from academic institutions like Harvard Medical School and 
uh, its associated hospitals, uh, that probably 60 or 70 percent of the support comes from NIH. In some states, they have state schools that get money from the state as well. Uh, philanthropy, no one has done that wonderful a study of this, but it, the best study that I've read recently from someone at MIT uh, says that if you take all factors in, about 5 to 20 percent, probably closer to 20 percent in places like Harvard, of the actual costs of research are, are paid for by uh, um, philanthropy one way or the other. Industry may give some support to research going on in schools and hospitals. Uh, they may also give some gifts. And then uh, in the end, for almost every institution that I'm aware of, and certainly for mine, uh, research loses money. And this is not just a game of uh, you know, playing with the books. It's really, it loses money with the model that we have. You could have a different model that wouldn't lose money, or maybe, or would break even, but the current model loses money. So it has to be made up unless you're going to have deficits by other sources, such as uh, what is listed here, clinical margins that are getting smaller, endowment uh, that isn't really rising all that much in most places, and uh, license and royalty income, which except for the big hits that occasionally occur, doesn't happen very often. Now, uh, the, the pharma biotech uh, world, that's, that, there's a lot of research that goes on there as well. More development than research, but r research and development goes on. Quantitatively, it's more than in academia. Uh, and the model is not, is not to develop new knowledge, although sometimes they will develop new knowledge, even when they're not trying. But uh, the goal is to develop approved drugs, and they will then feed back by having a profit uh, uh, associated with them to drive more of the same. And the, the arrow between these suggests that they really need to work together because to accomplish the goals of both new knowledge and new therapies, uh, both academia and industry are required. You simply can't have it with only one or the other, and their interactions are not yet optimized. So I'm, I'm going to run through a couple of things very quickly about uh, how I see research as the, the dean of a school that got a lot of this research funding. Uh, so NIH sets some level of funding through government uh, uh, appropriations, uh, and then they have a strategy. We don't always know very well what the strategy is, but there is something that is, appears to be like a strategy. Uh, that then creates NIH overall support. And then I'm just going to put these up here rapidly. There are many issues, okay, if it's over $30 billion a year. What kind of research support? Is it individual people who apply and say, I have a project? Is this, do you like this? It goes through a review, and then they give the, the funds for that project. Or are these large initiatives? Uh, I heard today when I was over at NIH that 40 percent of the NIH budget is for large initiatives and various programs that are not individual scientists putting in proposals. There's a big national debate about how the money flows to institutions, what we call direct costs, or money that the individual investigator actually spends on salaries and supplies and stuff. And then there's money that goes to the institution. Some people think there's too much. Some people think there's too little. As a dean, I know there's too little because it doesn't cover the costs of doing research. Uh, uh, and then, you know, do we want to fund basic, curiosity-driven research, people just trying to understand things better? I think that's extremely critical and important because we don't understand enough. Uh, or do we want to put all of our chips on disease-oriented research? What's the right balance? Uh, this is constantly being debated. Uh, how much does the government and NIH want to put into training? And training of who? We'd want to train PhD scientists. They're the most numerous. Many people are talking about the MD alone scientists like me and Tom as a vanishing breed. And then there's MD, PhD students. And how much does the NIH really want to support the whole research ecosystem, or does it just focus on these individual things? There are special interests. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But at the same time that they are organizations that do good, the academic health centers, the universities and institutes are a special interest. They obviously want more money. That's the way it works. And even if they're also doing good, they're a special interest. Disease-related and patient advocacy groups, they do God's work. Uh, they represent an interest for what they're interested in. Uh, the biopharma industry wants there to be some degree of NIH research, because that's where a lot of their ideas come from, uh, ultimately. And then there are other beneficiaries. And then uh, at the institutional level, you have to coordinate your NIH research with uh, money, rather, with uh, institutional planning, with philanthropy and industry. NIH has not been completely reliable overall in that its levels of funding had gone up. 
There was a doubling uh, that ended in 2002, I believe. And then since then, if you take one little blip out of it, the actual uh, inflation-adjusted dollars have been going down, about 20% over the last 10 or 12 years. This creates uh, confusion. Uh, we have a difficult, uh, in case you hadn't noticed, federal budget and political situation. So the conclusion that I reach is the health of an ecosystem built most importantly on NIH support is now challenged by the trajectory of funding, poor coordination between various funders and constituencies, and numerous, numerous misaligned uh, uh, incentives. And I, you know, my own view is, and we don't know, these predictions are hard, especially about the future, but I believe NIH trajectory is not going to be going up. It may be drifting down. I would love it if it changed. The trajectory of philanthropic funding, however, most people who are studying this now think that's going up. There's many mega billionaires who've said they're giving away their wealth, and they've expressed a real interest in biomedical science and research. So uh, we better uh, be prepared for this inflection point. I'll make just a couple of points before closing that, uh, you know, how might research philanthropy help? <laughs> well, it can help because it's a big source of funds uh, and uh, comes from all sorts of uh, philanthropic organizations and individuals. They can and sometimes do have very innovative approaches, more innovative than NIH. They may have organizational models that are, that are valuable. Uh, they may fill in gaps that NIH doesn't fill in itself. However, I've lived in a world where I see some of the problems, and that is uh, some of the donors take the view that NIH covers all of the costs of doing research, so they don't want to pay for that. And they have the ability to drive tough bargains because they'll say, if you don't take my money, I'll go to somewhere else. Uh, so frequently, they give very, very little institutional support uh, of the kind that is not project related. They sometimes have the power to convince institutions to support research that may not even be, at least in the, in the scientific leader's point of view, very, very uh, appropriate. Uh, and they, I have lived through examples where they come in and they say, uh, here's $100 million. You, Harvard, have to spend $100 million on top of what I'm giving you on this initiative. And you would say, well, maybe we shouldn't do that, except that's not what university presidents do. Uh, so uh, there are two opposing uh, models here. One is uh, philanthropists can enhance research by doing things the right way and giving funds in innovative ways. And then they can also be a detractor. And I think we need to work on that. So my final three thoughts here are uh, uh, we have really great opportunities. It's obvious that there's never been a time in history where we know more and have more capabilities than we do right now. Some of it is really mind-boggling. Uh, the arc of progress is clear. But, uh, you know, don't get carried away either because just because we learn something powerful and new, uh, the chance that that's going to turn in in our lifetimes into a powerful therapy more often than not doesn't turn out to be true because things are complicated. Uh, and I don't like the excessive optimism and spin, moonshot initiatives that have make no sense whatsoever, uh, uh, things like that, that make people doubt the honesty of what scientists say. And we don't want them to doubt us, uh, you know, inappropriately. And, um, uh, you know, I think the efficiency and quality of the current research ecosystem, we don't like to talk about it frequently, is not great. There's a real crisis of reproducibility of published academic research. There are problems with the sustainability of the workforce. So I believe the status quo is not an option and there have to be some real changes. It's hard for institutional leaders who are still in their institutional roles, though, to talk about that kind of change. Uh, I don't think we can do it by a central planning approach. That never works. Uh, but here are the things in closing that I would say we should rethink. Some aspects of how we fund uh, through NIH. Uh, the size of the workforce, it may well be we need a somewhat smaller but better funded uh, bioscience research workforce. We need to be able to uh, incentivize the relationship between academia and industry, which has numerous roadblocks that I hope will be dealt with. Uh, we should try to get some of the richest people in the world to understand that maybe they can do unbelievable good by the way they might change their philanthropic activities. and then find a way to integrate all these elements. So that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Well, I, I, while you qualified it, I will uh, hold you to it, the, uh, 
being guilty of being a cheerleader for basic research <laughs> leading to innovation. And after all, that's how it's justified. It's the National Institutes of Health, not the National Institutes of Scientists impressing each other. Um, I think the, the, the next panelist, uh, Dan Sarowitz, uh, is going to question that, that assumption. He is a distinguished uh, scholar from Arizona State University uh, on the topic of science and technology policy. And take it away. Uh, thanks, Tom. I think actually what I'll mostly do is, uh, is amplify a bit on some of the points Tom, that, that um, Jeff made. And if you don't mind, I'm going to quote you because you said something unbelievably radical and subversive uh, as, at, towards the end of your, um, which I agree with, mm -hmm. towards the end of your comments. But since you said them, I assume mm -hmm. you won't mind them being said again, no. which, which was, I hope not. it might be that we need a system with fewer researchers but more money for those fewer mm -hmm. researchers. Mm -hmm. um, that's, uh, that, that's a very tough thing to say in public, but it tells you something about the, the kind of, I mean, first of all, that's fearless. Thank you for saying it. Um, but the, the, the kind of uh, reflection that I think needs, needs to go on. So as Tom suggested, the perspective I want to take is, um, a, a broader systems perspective, even broadening beyond um, what, what Jeff was saying, uh, and to try to, to, from that perspective, think about the role of research in the context of the many functions uh, and activities and institutions that contribute to better health. Uh, so as, as Tom uh, alerted me to, he had a much better version of this, um, uh, of this slide in his, uh, in his introductory remarks, but this just, um, documents the, uh, the progressive, remarkable, wonderful decline in, in mortality from cardiovascular disease through, through I think, the 1990s. I can't quite read that. Um, compared to progress being made on, on other diseases. And the point that I want to, um, uh, uh, that I want this remarkable trend to illustrate um, is that uh, this didn't come from one particular intervention, one particular technology or finding. It was an emergent phenomenon from an innovation system, an innovation ecosystem uh, that resulted from mutual learning among things like clinical practice uh, and treatment from new drugs uh, like statins, from behavioral change, like recognizing the importance of exercise and diet. And, and all of these things together over time through reduction in smoking and other behavioral activities. All these things together through time um, have led to this, uh, this progress that we can all feel good about and that ought to be a uh, model for our aspirations for, for all of the uh, diseases that, um, and conditions that face us. And I guess since everyone's done their conflict of interest um, statements, my con uh, I'm going to die, so that's one of my uh, <laughs> interests. Um, I never got any money from, from NIH, and I can say that in my efforts to try to get NIH to fund um, some research on uh, the types of problems that I'm going to talk about now, we've been told they would not like to fund those things. Um, but I'm not against federally funded uh, science at all. I've gotten lots of money from, from the National Science Foundation, and I'm grateful for it. So, um, so the, 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 the perspective that I just want to emphasize for a moment here is that um, that outcome in the cardiovascular realm reflects an extraordinarily calm. I have more double-ended arrows here than Jeff did on his, <laughs> uh, on his figure and more um, players, institutions, and, and connections. Um, and the, let's see, is there, a, is there a light on this? Is that, no, okay, anyway, so the upper right-hand corner uh, is what most of our discussion has been about, the scientific community and the creation of knowledge and, and publications. Um, but also, as Jeff has mentioned, uh, the expectation is that those feed into the, um, uh, to the innovation process and the creation of drugs and devices and, and so on. Um, but we also can't neglect the fact that all of these are related to the, to the um, uh, provision of service, health care delivery, uh, including the uh, vitriolic public uh, political debate that's going on right now about the Affordable Care Act. Um, the, uh, the, the venues of delivery of healthcare are extraordinarily important uh, sources of learning, every bit as important, I think you'd agree, as the, um, a, a, as the bench and the, uh, and, and the uh, genome sequencing device. Um, and all of these, in a, in a well-functioning um, uh, um, innovation ecosystem, are speaking to each other, learning from each other, and, and leading again to this emergent phenomenon of, of complex determinants of improved health. Um, <coughs> Now, the, the point I want to emphasize, and this is what Tom was, was uh, alerting you to, was I, I think that the, the language and the concepts we use to discuss about this are quite impoverished. Um, and every discussion like this 
the one that we're having here, has to include a, uh, a focus on the importance of uh, basic, unfettered, uh, curiosity-driven research. And I think that's important, too. Um, but uh, two things to be said about it. One is it's only one part of research as a whole. And the other is it's only one part of basic research. Uh, that fundamental investigation into, uh, in, into new phenomena, into areas of, of broad areas of, of, of ignorance can be um, pursued uh, detached from any thought of application or it can also be pursued in the, in the context of application. And yet, uh, too often the fight we get into or the insistence that we, the, 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 the assertions that we make are about the importance of protecting the autonomy of the individual science, scientists so that they can pursue uh, their curiosity uh, in whatever direction it may lead. And this is very much derived from a kind of the, the, the Bible of modern science policy written by Vannevar Bush, who was uh, Franklin Roosevelt's science advisor during World War II a document called Science the Endless Frontier, some of you have heard of it, in which he articulated very compellingly the importance of the autonomy of the scientist. Um, but I would say I think that's become somewhat uh, uh, fetishized and more dangerously, again, it's become the thing that all discussions end up uh, devolving to. And so, so I'm here to try to open up the discussion beyond that and to say that basic research is important. It's one part of the ecosystem. And an excessive focus on it, and especially an excessive focus on the size of that enterprise, um, I think has not uh, allowed us to address um, the challenges of making sure that the, that the biomedical innovation ecosystem is healthy. Um, so uh, again, as Jeff uh, alluded to, there are some significant stresses uh, in, in this ecosystem. One is, um, one, one may argue with this particular uh, graph, but I think there's a general sense that the rate of innovation um, in, in uh, biomedical, uh, biomedical field uh, is not what it ought to be. Uh, a researcher named uh, Jack Scannell in the UK has, uh, has attempted to measure it in a, uh, a somewhat mischievous way. He has documented what he calls e -Room's Law, which is Moore's Law backwards. Uh, it is an exponential decline in the rate of, uh, of production of, um, of, of innovation uh, uh, related to the, in, in terms of the amount of investment in research, that on the left, for those of any quantitative bent at all, is a logarithmic scale, um, so that that is, in fact, a fairly steep, uh, steep decline. So there's a crisis in what I'd say is productivity, uh, and I think this is, is, is fairly widely accepted. We're not getting what we uh, would like to get from the dollars that we invest in research. Um, another way of looking at that is the failure rates of clinical trials, especially in fields like, uh, in areas like oncology and, and, uh, and neuroscience, uh, approaching 90% uh, failure rates in clinical trials if you add up uh, the failures across all three phases. Um, and um, for a long time, this was, this was generally uh, um, interpreted as, well, this is hard. You know, we did the easy stuff, we picked the, uh, the low-hanging fruit, and now, um, uh, and now the problem is that we're trying to do things that are really hard. Um, but a couple of companies, especially uh, Bayer and Amgen, um, began to ask uh, a, a, a more difficult question. Maybe it's not just that these problems are hard, but maybe the evidence base uh, that we're using to choose, our, to choose the, the, the chemicals that we're going to test is not as reliable as, we, as we'd like it to, to be. And um, this work led, gave rise fairly quickly to what is commonly called the reproducibility crisis, the, the, the awareness that um, uh, a significant portion, um, you can argue about the percent, but a significant portion of the peer-reviewed public literature, uh, uh, peer-reviewed published literature may not be uh, a very good quality. This, um, uh, this recognition to the credit of the science community is not something anyone's trying to hush up. Uh, there is an entire um, uh, research group at Stanford uh, called Metrics that's focused on uh, thinking about what to do with it. Uh, there is a recent book by the uh, uh, science reporter from NPR, uh, Richard Harris, called Rigor Mortis, uh, that documents it, and he's a, he's a friend of the enterprise. Um, uh, but I think there is a, a I know, there is a, a strong sense that, that uh, much of what's being produced by the system, the academic research system especially, uh, is, is uh, not of reliable quality. And, uh, and that this in turn uh, relates to a set of incentives 
uh, around research and what it is to be an academic researcher and a basic researcher especially that focuses on productivity and publica number of publications, uh, symbols of status like how many grants you get, how many graduate students you have, et cetera. Um, and this speaks, I think, very directly to Mary's point about, um, about scientists and their obligation to, to the public. Um, the, the incentive system for researchers in a significant part of the innovation system is not uh, towards uh, addressing the, the problems in, uh, in human health. It's towards addressing the problems and advancing uh, one's career, justified by the model that as long as it's unfettered research, it's worth doing. Um, so what I want to end uh, with is the thought that, that this is just one problem in an extraordinarily complex and in many ways dysfunctional innovation ecosystem. Um, questions of pricing, uh, healthcare delivery, the debate over, 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 uh, over the Affordable Care Act, anything you can put your finger on uh, can, can, means you're putting your finger on a problem in, in that ecosystem. Uh, but my, um, my final point is not uh, one of hopelessness, it's one of what should we do to look for areas to intervene? Um, because I don't think simply pouring more money into, into basic research um, is going to solve the larger, larger problem. It might solve it if we begin to ask ourselves, what's the appropriate size of the system and what's the appropriate fun funding uh, to, uh, to address that size, but we're not yet asking those kinds of questions. But what I want to do instead is just suggest there's some really interesting and cool um, in, uh, institutional innovations going on by groups that have been unhappy with what the system is yielding uh, and have tried to do things in different ways. I'm just going to mention three very quickly here. Uh, one is a group out of Cambridge that you probably know well, patients like me. Um, they are taking advantage of social media to connect uh, patient groups uh, who have diseases that have been very resistant to, um, uh, to making progress, things like, uh, like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and um, other neurodegenerative diseases. And the idea there is that the experience of individual patients um, as they try on a daily basis to cope with their diseases can in fact uh, add up to uh, a huge amount of knowledge and potential for learning that the, that the current uh, innovation system can't capture. Uh, another example is one that's being led out of my university. It's called GBM Agile. It's a global adaptive clinical trial for glioblastoma, which is the most deadly um, brain cancer. And it uh, is an attempt to, because, it's, because even though it is a well-known cancer, uh, the number of people who have it isn't that great, which is, of course, a good thing, but it means it's very difficult to do trials for lots of different chemicals at the same time. So this is an attempt to coordinate across many different countries, many different trials in an adaptive way, which means as you learn things, you change the nature of the trial. Um, you accept the fact that, uh, that populations are not, uh, are, are not simply random um, uh, populations of people, that the, the, standard, the gold standard clinical trial uh, approach actually is not appropriate when you're dealing with something that may have many contingencies. And um, so it's being done in real time now, and it's an attempt to, and here it's largely a coordination effort. How do you work with many different hospitals and many different clinical uh, uh, trial groups across many different countries uh, with data that's commensurable and that allows you to learn, again, quickly in time? And then finally, um, the next speaker, Fran Visco, will talk about this, but I'm a big admirer of, of what uh, the National Breast Cancer Coalition has done it, with the Artemis Project, which is an attempt with almost no money uh, to bring together uh, scientists and academia and the private sector and government uh, with patient activists to drive really fast towards possible solutions uh, to breast cancer that have not been emergent from the current system. So what I want to say about all three of these is they weren't funded by government and they weren't funded by the private sector. They've been funded, uh, they've been to a significant extent self-funded, uh, but also they reflect the passion and the commitment of individuals um, working partly within the system, but also with a reflection that the innovation system is not performing as it should. And I think it's to these types of innovative institutional arrangements that we ought to look uh, for thinking about the direction that the overall system might evolve in the future. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Dan. So you've already introduced Fran, but I'll just say in addition that uh, it's uh, great to have Fran here because I, the way I would characterize it is she took a personal challenge and juxtaposed it with a brilliant legal mind to solve a practical problem uh, and really do something about innovation. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I am a 29-year breast cancer survivor 
and I was a partner in a law firm in Philadelphia when I was diagnosed. Um, I had the good fortune to lead the National Breast Cancer Coalition, which I have done for the past 25 years. And just briefly, that is a coalition of groups from around the country. And we have two arms. We have an advocacy arm and we have a programs arm. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And our goal is really to change all systems in breast cancer. We don't do direct services. We don't run support groups. We are really about system change. And our mission is to end breast cancer. Now our goals are access, to expand access to quality care for everyone, uh, all those at risk and with breast cancer, research to make certain that there are sufficient funds and individuals doing meaningful research that will help achieve our goal and influence. We believe very strongly that patient advocates should have a seat at every table and be involved in every level in uh, breast cancer, including biomedical research systems. So just a couple of examples for advocacy. When we started the coalition, our first campaign was to increase funding, government funding for breast cancer research, but we did it in a way that is the hallmark of NBCC. We did our homework. We held our own research hearings, we did independent research, and we came up with a plan how much the federal government could spend over the coming year that could be well spent for breast cancer. We didn't want to just throw money at the problem. And so we took the results of that analysis and hearings, and we went to Capitol Hill, and we were successful. And that year, breast cancer research funding went up by $300 million, from $100 million to over $400 million. And that's what launched the Department of Defense peer-reviewed breast cancer research program, which I'll we'll also talk about briefly. And of course, our advocacy works on expanding access to care. Just one brief example, the CDC spends hundreds of millions of dollars a year on mammograms and pap smears for uninsured women, but there was no treatment component. And we said, the government is gonna find cancer, you're gonna to have to treat cancer. And so we wrote a piece of legislation that would move these individuals into Medicaid for all of their healthcare costs. And we were successful in getting that enacted into law. But we're also about education and training because we don't believe in more money for research. We believe in money for research that is well spent and that is meaningful. And we believe in having trained advocates at the table to help make those determinations. And so we developed our own training program. The most well known in our world is Project LEAD, which is science training for lay advocates. The Institute is happening in a couple of weeks and it is truly teaching lay advocates about DNA, RNA, critical analysis of literature, the immune system. It's not updating them on research, it's giving them the skills to enable them to understand the process, language, and concepts of science so that they can then be a part of setting priorities, collaborating with scientists to design research, and determining then when money is warranted and when it isn't. And we believe in critical advocacy, critical analytical advocacy, and very much the importance of patient advocate leadership and involvement, again, at every level. And I should have said at the very beginning, we do not take, nor do we apply for any federal funding, not me individually, nor the National Breast Cancer Coalition. So we do believe the government has a very large role to play in our mission to end breast cancer. They are the ones who should be focused on public health issues, social justice, on the health of a population. And they can help facilitate innovation without the need to make a profit or be published. They can help foster appropriate policies that will advance science, but also improve health, because that's the ultimate goal. And the government requires sufficient funding and funding being a source of sufficient funding to fulfill that role, but it also requires pretty intense public oversight. Our reaction to the, um, to the um, suggestion that NIH funding should be cut wasn't uh, horror. It was probably it should not be cut at this time, but it really needs more transparency. We need to figure out what's happening with the money that they're spending now and how we can make it better. They need to spend the money better. So, you know, I, I, I looked at the title of this panel and it talked about medical innovation. And I'm not sure I know what that is. I'm not sure we can agree on what medical innovation is because in my world of breast cancer, I don't see a lot of it. 
Drugs are approved that have no real clinical benefit, or if they have clinical benefit, it's minimal. Maybe it'll add a month to someone's life. It's research that follows, follows, follows everyone else. It's incremental change that could ultimately result in progress, but is that innovation? And is there innovation if you have interventions that aren't accessible to anyone because they can't afford them? So we look very carefully at that question. I think in my world of breast cancer, most innovation has happened not through government funding initially. So for example, Herceptin, trastuzumab, is considered a breakthrough and an innovation in breast cancer. The initial work on um, trastuzumab, HER2 overexpressing breast cancer, was not funded by the NIH. It could not get funding through the NIH. And that has been true in a number of different instances. There haven't been that many breakthroughs for me to give you examples of. But how do we measure success? You know, we could measure success by the number of proton beam therapy machines there are in the world. We could measure success by the number of buildings and institutions or researchers or pay line or publications or patents. But that's not how we measure success, nor should any of us. It's by human outcomes. And I'm not going to go into the data that all of you know about where we, ha where we rank as a country by the World Health Organization, by the CDC, and by others in terms of health measures. But I will talk a bit about progress in breast cancer because we haven't made very much. Now, there's, as you know, um, over 40,000 women will die this year of breast cancer. There's been no change in lethal disease diagnosis since 1978. Now, mortality rates have been going down 1.9% per year, but there's no acceleration in the rate of decrease. So it looks as though we've really captured what inner innovation and progress there was a number of years ago, and we're getting the benefit of that now. And we really have to look at global progress. Global progress, I will just give you one statistic. Now, uh, in 2012, 522,000 women worldwide died of breast cancer. It's estimated that in 2030, at the present rate of innovation and progress, more than 770,000 women will die. And I like to show this only because it shows you across about 40 countries the incidence of mortality in breast cancer. The red line is mortality. It is not very different among countries. The blue line is incidence, and that is skewed by technology and by diagnostics. But it is not lowering mortality significantly differently among countries. So let's talk about our solutions. We believe, again, to involve trained and educated advocates at every level. We, need, we have created some new models. I talked about the DOD Breast Cancer Research Program that our advocacy brought about. And I want to just talk quickly about what that is, the mission of the DOD BCRP um, program, which we go to Congress to lobby for continuation funding for this program every year, and the vision is to end breast cancer by funding innovative high-impact research, but it really is through a partnership and collaboration with consumers, with advocates. We, as advocates who are trained and educated, sit at every table, and a number of the mechanisms that we create, uh, that the program creates, require collaboration between scientists and trained advocates if they want to get funding. It's a very strong conflict of interest policy in this program, probably the strongest I've certainly ever heard of, and it's incredibly efficient. It's about 10% goes to administrative costs and the rest goes to funding the worldwide scientific community. But I think very important about this program, too, is the fact that it really is not driven by, it's not a top-down uh, effort. It is mechanism-based, so the steering committee designs mechanisms to foster innovation, you know, uh, concept awards, idea awards, and also to foster impact, clinical impact, clinical trials awards, uh, translation, transformational vision awards. It's the worldwide scientific community collaborating with advocates that decide what the questions are that should be funded. And so I want to talk very briefly about MBCC's Artemis project that Dan mentioned. We were very frustrated by what we saw as the lack of progress. Sitting at the table, even at the DOD program, you see so many of the same thing. 
you know, proposal after proposal asking the same boring question that really is going to make a significant difference in breast cancer. And so we decided to do something on our own. We wanted to set the agenda. We wanted to decide, to decide who would come to the table, what the questions would be. And so we launched the Artemis Project. We focus on two main broad questions that I, we don't see addressed very much in biomedical research. One is primary prevention. How do we stop women and men from getting breast cancer in the first place? And the second is preventing metastasis. How do we understand the process of metastasis and how can we intervene to stop it? There is a lot going on into curing metastasis and that's amazingly important and we do some work in that arena too. But how can we actually stop that process so that if you do get breast cancer, you don't die of it? We have a collaborative effort where we brought together a scientist from different countries, from different disciplines. The only criterion that we apply is, are they risk takers? Are they visionaries? Have they so shown that they've been creative? Can they really make a difference and have they shown that? We bring these people together and believe it or not, they love being a part of this even though we don't give them money because what they say to us is no one challenges us to be bold anymore and that's why we started doing this. And so they love being a part of this. These research plans are developed by these groups. We have a little bit of money to give seed grants, grants but we actually leverage the results of this and they go get funding from outside funding sources. Um, we're moving along quite well. Our preventive work is focused right now on a preventive vaccine in breast cancer. Our preventing uh, metastasis work is focused on tumor dormancy. But what I want to say really primarily, and the message I'd like to leave you with is, the goal has to be saving lives. Not buildings, not patents, not publications. It has to be saving lives, not even funding saving lives and we should start there and then figure out what the system is that will get us there as quickly as possible. Thank you, Fran. It's predictably very powerful. So I'm just going to very quickly wrap up by keying off of a somewhat depressing uh, statement by Dan, the e law, that it's getting more and more expensive to get new products and then what Fran said that uh, we seem to be a bit of a stalemate on the breast cancer front. And my simple answer is that biology is a bitch. <laughs> it, it, there's just no easy answer. And so luck's very important. But there's another aspect to this, which is uh, the evil word profit. Now here's back to the, that timeline that had the NIH funding and the longevity curve. And you notice that the private investment, that's pharma, biotech, it tracks right along with the longevity. Now, you arguably could say that's where the innovation is coming from. It's coming from the private sector. Now, that's not a very popular idea. I don't have an elaborate polling apparatus like Mary does, but I poll people and I say, so, you know, here we've got these great advances. Where do you think it's coming from? Doctors, hospitals, medical schools? Answer, well, yeah, I guess it's all those things. Uh, am I missing anything? Silence. What about industry? The responses go from, yeah, I guess it provides some technology. Don't even get me started about pharma. And this sentiment exists in very high places. So this uh, 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 famous economist, Joseph Stiglitz from Columbia, says all the good stuff's coming out of the GABC and industry just profiteers. Um, and the quest course then becomes, if I think, Mary, if you polled people and said, do you think drug prices are too high? Do you think oh, we should regulate them? Let's ask the people then, here. And, uh, <laughs> say, well, absolutely. Problem is, investment is important. You chase away. And I, I have to address the, the great American guilt trip about how we spend so much and have worse outcomes. Actually, if you take homicides and uh, fit, uh, auto fatalities off the table, we're about the same as the rest of the world. Now, is there a reason why the NIH supported research? And first of all, Stiglitz is wrong because I think the, art, the evidence is pretty clear that uh, the bulk of new discoveries that are actually are innovations that save lives come from the private sector. I'd be happy to send any of you these references uh, if you email me and I'll do that. Now, why is, might NIH supported academic research not be compatible with innovation? Well, I compare it to the previous innovation era. I would argue that then the emphasis was on solving problems. 
Now it's on the scientists impressing each other. In the previous era, people studied sick folks and dogs and uh, rabbits. Now, it's not elegant to do that. I'm the only klutz here who can't make this thing work. <laughs> is go, to use that, so got it. So, uh, inbred my, you know, these surrogates, which are much more elegant, much more e faster to get data, but arguably less relevant. And then in the uh, previous era, I'll forget about this thing, it was medically trained people who did the research. Now it's predominantly basic scientists. These aren't bad things. These aren't bad things that were on the right-hand side of the column. It's just that the emphasis, I think, it needs to be changed. So with that, I'd like to open up the discussion to the panel. Um, Mary, you know, I would, with respect to this uh, scientists impressing each other, you know, that, that document that you, uh, that was that the um, distinguished individuals wrote for the Congress about the NIH in two last year about what the NIH should be doing, very much emphasized this kind of novelty yeah, yeah. and that it, mm -hmm. it really, I didn't think, I didn't ask anyone else to weigh in on that. It was sort of standard issue, impressive science. I don't know if I'm, you've read the, I didn't read the document. I haven't read it. I, it's, it's actually quite short. And I think there's some new ideas in there, Tom, but uh, I also would agree that uh, there are some uh, retreads, if you will. Um, and I don't think that they're all bad. But I, I think the, the um, I know what the motivation was, is to make some changes at the NIH. That was the motivation. It was not to uh, justify the status quo. And the very fact, the little piece that I showed you on the slide about um, calling for some training in understanding and being able to relate to and talk about the public context of science is very definitely a new thing. Um, and it's not clear that's going to happen, by the way. But the whole premise of putting that report together is what changes would be productive and useful going forward. So I have a question about that. Yeah. Often when we hear about the importance of scientists communicating with the public, it's to get the public to understand how important what they do is, and so they will support more funding for their work. So I don't necessarily think that's such a great thing. So, well, if we're so what does yeah. that mean? Yeah. So that's not the way uh, Research America either trains, and we do a lot of training of scientists in communicating with the public, but we don't, we're, not, uh -huh. we're not about trying to proselytize or persuade, please see it my way. Instead, we're talking about having a conversation, and you saw, I think, on my slide, but I work for you. If you start from the premise that uh, science serves the public interest, you're going to have a different conversation than, I'm a really smart scientist, and you need to understand, or maybe not understand even, you need to support me and applaud me if you know I get the Nobel Prize. So, so it's a different thing. Yeah, so just one other question about that, not necessarily to you. One of the things that we see a lot recently that is very disturbing is um, sort of publication by press release. And it's as though academic institutions, you know, they just elbow each other out of the way to get a press release out about something that is so preliminary that it doesn't warrant attention, but it's touted as a breakthrough. I've also seen, I've been to many scientific meetings where I'm in the hall and I hear a great science presentation and then I'll go into the press room and I hear something very different about the same work. And it is very disturbing to us if that's the way scientists are communicating and academic institutions are communicating to the public too. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that we advocate is that there be more, um, communication, if you will, between, take average institution, between the medical school, the uh, graduate science divisions, whatever, and the journalism schools or the departments of communication. Um, there's two reasons for that. It's to help the science uh, scientists in training or in, in their career become better at communicating, not lecturing to, but communicating 
with non-scientists. And on the flip side, it helps young aspiring journalists and those who teach them um, have a better understanding of what the professional aspirations, goals, day-to-day -day life of the, of the scientist is. There's a big gap between those two, typically. Yeah. I didn't ask the question to put you on the spot. I asked That's it to right. put the academic institution on the spot. But, <laughs> That's but right. Thank you. But thank you. <laughs> with, with respect to academic institutions, is in some ways we've been victims of our success. When Jeff and I started out, there wasn't that much we could do for patients. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot more leisure time for physicians to do research. Um, and that, 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 uh, now that, of course, the, there's much more we can do, and these institutions have become huge. They compete with each other. You see all this mm -hmm. puffery that goes on. Um, and that, that, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, with respect to what Jeff brought up about philanthropy, yeah, ha has surprising. there been uh, in, in, in the Breast Cancer Coalition? I mean, have you had made, my, I, my recollection is that philanthropy was absolutely a key point in the Herceptin story. I mean, yes, everybody I mean, that's should where read, there's a book about that, right. that if anybody thinks that innovation is linear, some scientists discover something and then great things happen, <laughs> should read that book and there are other right. accounts of it. It's Bob a Zell's roller coaster, yeah. it goes back and forth. and, it, and it, yeah. Yeah, well, another example it was of a, lifetime a movie. different way to get funding that crosses these boundaries is uh, with respect to the cystic fibrosis mm -hmm. treatment that is now available, which, you know, cystic fibrosis, the gene was discovered a, quite a long time ago, uh, and uh, everyone thought, well, maybe that's going to lead to treatment <laughs> for cystic fibrosis, but of course it didn't. We've known what sickle cell uh, disease, the molecular lesion, for 50 years, and there's still no treatment for sickle cell disease. Not easy to do these things. But there was an approach that Vertex Pharmaceutical uh, uh, developed to find a interaction of a small molecule with the proteins that are associated with sickle cell, with uh, uh, cystic fibrosis, and many people were skeptical. There aren't a lot of people with cystic fibrosis, and the initial treatment was just for a very small subset of the ones who did, who had a very rare genetic lesion. Why am I telling you this? Because there was a, at a point when it looked like the whole uh, uh, effort to find this treatment would fail, there was a relationship between the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and the company that was developing it. They actually provided substantial funds in exchange for an ultimate share of the revenues if a drug was ever developed. And I don't know if you've read the story about it, but the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, I think now it has more than a billion dollars that came in from Vertex because that has led to now several different drugs that treat and improve the lives of people with cystic fibrosis. And uh, it's just another model where the patient groups can find a way to do venture philanthropy. I also will point out that another model that uh, is really changing a lot of medical innovation, in my opinion, uh, we didn't talk about it, but used to be that pharma companies would really only think about developing drugs that you could find one drug, you know, millions of people would take it and most of them would get better. That's the way it worked for hypertension, diabetes, even cancer. Uh, now you have, I think it's about 30, 40% of all the new drug approvals in the last several years have been for ultra rare diseases. And I will give a, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a, I will reveal that I'm now advising two biotech companies that are both going after ultra rare diseases. And these have been some of the most exciting times of my scientific career, hanging out with people who used, many of them used to be academics, then they went into this little company, and they are going like a laser after a disease that may have 4,000 people that have the disease, but they, they are brilliant in thinking about the strategies with a limited amount of money that they get, then they raise money from new venture rounds, and then they are trying to develop drugs. Now, some people would say, why are we spending money on a disease that there's just 4,000 people who have it? The people who have the 4,000 4, are very excited that someone is doing that for their rare disease. So I just want to bring that up as another example of how things are changing. They're not completely static in that regard. So on that exciting note, let's open this up. I'm getting the high sign from management that we have to move along, get to the reception. So yes, sir. Hi, I'm, I'm Jeff from Prepress with Merck, and uh, thank you very much. It's been a great panel. Um, you know, you were talking about um, 
there were a couple slides that touched on ecosystem. And, and while we've been talking a lot about taxpayer funding for research and who gets it and how efficient it's been, um, I, I, I'd like you to maybe touch a little bit about on, on re really other important aspects, which are the regulatory environment, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. R&D is done. Mm -hmm. how, how does that incentivize or disincentivize companies like Merck or, or the mm -hmm. public sector uh, institutions? And the other is um, market incentives. I mean, are we really harnessing uh, market incentives to drive research? Thank you. Um, I can uh, speak to at least part of that. Uh, the FDA um, is horribly underfunded for this task that society asks of it. It's, it's funded, it's funding from our taxes, you know, it's government funding, uh, provide less funds to the FDA than the school district they're located in, Montgomery County, which happens to have a great school district, by the way. But this is just almost laughable that they would have such limited funding and have, I think the last time I heard, almost a thousand vacancies in employment. We ask a great deal of them. We ask them to regulate 30% of the consumer environment, you know, world, consumables, uh, something like that. I'm, don't quote me on that, but it's some very high percentage. So uh, that's, there's a tug of war politically and to a certain extent with the public about is the FDA net good, net problematic, moving fast enough, move, moving too slow, you know, whatever. It, it's hard for the FDA to win because if something goes wrong, <laughs> It's their fault, you know, it's at their doorstep, even if they did everything con you know, conceivably possible at the time Washington to prevent Rose. that, you know. So we, I think we have a real challenge in this nation. We haven't figured that out. I need to just give a plug here okay. that Scott Gottlieb, the new commissioner, is an AEI yeah. scholar. Um, oh, and the, 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 but it's also worth pointing out that it's not just that the FDA, which I happen to believe is the best game in town for vetting the safety and efficacy of, of, it's not far from perfect, but it's sure better than the peer review system that uh, 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 Jeff, that uh, Dan alluded to. Um, but but in, in the institutions that Jeff and I come from, you know, since we started out, we have got a whole raft of, of bureaucracies that now really get in the way of research. Used to be, say, gee, that's an interesting patient. I'd like to take a blood sample and, you know, measure the porcelain level. Can't do that now. You've got to have a, a committee uh, convened, and it's not worth it. And, you know, if it's animals, whether it's uh, uh, conflict of interest, all kinds of things. So, but the problem with regulation is it never ratchets back. Yeah. Any other? Yes. Lou Gagliano uh, came out of the medical device industry, and now I, uh, I advise uh, startup medical companies on technologies and how to bring them to market. And oftentimes we go for NIH funding, and I would say over the last three years, it has been very difficult because the, the review process of the NIH has turned into science and not application. And, and innovation is two parts. It's based on leveraging science, but it's also leveraging on delivery of the, the technology. So the perspective, I guess, I, I would ask from you is, do you see the same kind of science over innovation as being the role that the NIH seems to be fostering, rather than a balance between these two important principles? Well, I've had some experience with SBIR grants. Mm -hmm. And the NIH convenes a bunch of uh, science experts who have no clue about what it takes to get a product to market. And that, that I think you're absolutely right. That's a serious problem. Well, I'd say it's a problem, but um, you have to pro understand how the problem could possibly be remedied. I think the, in the academic institutions, their main goal, as I think I see it and we see it, is to develop new knowledge which can then be applied and taken forward. They're, they're not often the people to take it forward. So the question is, how do you find good and effective interactions between the people who can take it forward, who are focused on that, and the people who have made the initial discoveries? And, and that's where I think we have to put the effort. I'm not sure NIH is the right organization as it's currently 
constituted to be developing <coughs> things. People have been arguing about that. Should NIH be a little pharmaceutical company? I have never met a single person in biopharma who thought that's a good idea. Yes, sir. Hi, Mike Miller. Uh, I got a, maybe it's a simple question or a complicated question, I'm not sure. Um, the cures legislation that got signed into law at the end of the year, end of 16, right direction, wrong direction, meh, it's not gonna make any difference, it's inconsequential. I think it's and the Ma right Mary, yeah. I know your position, I wanna hear what the other people say. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm for yes, it's the right direction. <laughs> I haven't paid enough attention to that. I, I just been focusing on other things, so we, I don't want to comment. We did not support the cures legislation because of what we saw as it undermining FDA's role. We were very concerned about that portion of the bill. And also um, increasing funding at NIH without any kind of oversight or expectation that there would be an analysis of how the money's being spent and if that's the way it should be spent. Well, I, I do um, have a different viewpoint on it. We, we uh, talked to folks at the FDA and others at some length um, before getting involved, and things changed in that bill over the 18 months or almost two years, I think, that it was um, debated. And I think came out in a good place for FDA, and I don't doubt that it isn't perfect. I'm sure it isn't perfect. Um, and can be, and there can be improvement going forward. That was one part. The other part was um, oh, whether the additional funds for NIH will have adequate oversight. Um, that remains to be seen. I think pushing to assure that there's adequate oversight will almost certainly assure that there is, because there needs to be. There should be. But we were definitely all in, you're, you're right, Mike, in, in working on and with people who are trying to get that legislation passed. My view of it is mainly cheerleading. And the, the, most of the NIH increased funding is heavily earmarked, which is always, a, I think, a bad idea. Um, but we'll see. Yes. So um, I'm a, actually a scientist currently funded by the NIH. And what we always hear is that it's actually really competitive to get grants from the NIH now. So every 10 grants you submit, you get one funded. So um, I was wondering if you guys had comments on that, mentioning maybe we're not doing research for research's sake, but necessarily trying to find a lot of research that's good science that's not getting funded. Well, the, the, the pathologies of the academic research enterprise, I think, are well known and no one <laughs> disagrees. Um, there's been no effort to um, restrict the number of scientists going into new fields so that people like you early in career, in, in your career are um, at the tail end of a long period of exponential growth of the number of scientists um, that can't possibly be matched by growth in, in, in public funding. Um, I think that there's also very strong awareness that when uh, competition increases and becomes really as brutal as it is now in academia, that all sorts of perverse incentives uh, come into play in terms of how you decide who's gonna get funded and why, what counts as something worth funding. Um, so uh, I'd like to say something hopeful uh, to someone at your stage in your career. I guess the thing that, that, um, that I uh, experienced many times is there's a lot of optimism uh, in, among young scientists for wanting to contribute to making the world a, yeah. uh, a, a better place and that uh, I think we need to, that is the, the and enterprise itself needs to really attend to the careers of young scientists um, and to recognize, this gets to your point very directly, to recognize Do that this ain't gonna be the 1960s or 70s or 80s something. or the doubling period, it is a different time and if we're serious about those careers and therefore serious about the contribution of basic science to innovation, um, that's an area where we really, really mm -hmm. need to, uh, uh, to, bite, to bite the bullet. Um, there, as I said, there are some organizations, some groups that are starting to look carefully at the incentive structure, um, but until there's a recognition that everyone isn't gonna be able to play the game uh, at the same level that they'd like to, and that every research one university isn't gonna get all the money that they want, uh, I th and until that discussion leads to a discussion about how we will 
arrive at an understanding of an appropriate size of the of the enterprise, it's going to be tough going for for people early in their career. Fra Fran has so, a response. I just want to say one thing. One problem is that these I lay a lot of blame in the academic institutions. Is when the when the GABC formed, they offloaded responsibility. Uh, on people like you. You've got to go panhandle to the government. And uh, any institution that has pretensions of being a research in, uh, organization ought to be supporting its people. Now, that may be fewer people, uh, but that, that, that the idea that, you, that uh, uh, you're on the dole from the outside world, it just makes no sense. Fran. Well, I would just say one word that, because I was at, at NIH earlier today talking with one of the directors, and uh, we were discussing the fact that uh, it, what in most institutions, what our scientists are like, and this person from NIH used the phrase, it's rent a scientist. So essentially, they build the buildings, they give you very little commitment, your job is to raise money, if you raise it, they'll let you continue there, uh, but you're like a little entrepreneur trying to do that on your own. Now, we did a lot of great things with that system. I was one of those entrepreneurs, but when the terms of the agreement change, the success rate changes, the other options change, you're going to see that under enormous pressure. And then you have to wonder whether more institutions have to focus on how do they create an environment for people who they will support and won't make completely dependent on a grant uh, every couple of years. Fran? So I just wanted to say, in the meantime, while this is all being worked out, um, the DOD Breast Cancer Research Program has a mechanism that I think is very helpful for young, really creative scientists, and that is called the Era of Hope Scholar. And what they try to do is they try to identify, through proposal process, individuals who are very early in their career, but who have shown um, you know, a, a record of leadership and vision and creativity. And if they get one of these awards, they're given a lot of money because what the thinking is, you want to find people early on and give them enough money to begin to do work before they get sucked in and destroyed by the existing system. <laughs> Over here. Thank you all for the great discussion. My name is Joshua. I went to Georgetown Med School here, and I'm chief product officer for a group in town that takes a thousand students a year to study abroad, pre-med students in hospitals all around the world. And one of the things that several of our students seem to be most confused or discouraged about is, to put it succinctly, why Martin Shkreli is the villain instead of the hero. And to elaborate on that, I'll basically say, so uh, companies like Amazon and Uber that have started off with pricing integrity, basically understanding that it's a signal of value and that things of a lot of value are gonna be priced high and inspire a lot of other people, like Uber drivers, to participate in that market why he's looked at as the villain when we recognize something as a society, like an HIV drug is very valuable, prices it high to encourage other people to go into that market, providing a profit incentive, but then we all yell and point the finger at him and say, no, you shouldn't be doing that. Do you have a simple response to that, or what would you say to a pre-med student who's discouraged by that? I haven't met any pre-med students who are discouraged by the negative thoughts about Martin Shkreli, so mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that. I, I think that's above our pay grade is to deal with that, at least right now. I think one they should final, get out of the health field if they could. One final question because uh, we, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I see a lot of young people and I'm kind of growing old, so I don't know what this is, so I think I can throw in some light here because uh, uh, I'm so grateful that I'm in this country, and I'm like now I've been seeing this thing. Maybe I was like 30, and then I learned a lot, you know, because uh, I act like a kid, and so I never paid attention to these bigger things. And I always wanted to become a medical doctor and save lives and all that because I thought that's something where we need to be 100% honest and above, right? And now you see here all oh, this thing, and I took business class, honest to God, just so that I will feel normal before, without going crazy in this country. Anyway, so I will hit on the uh, topic of ethics, I think, uh, and you uh, younger folks like the medical student, I'm so glad that you are here uh, to sh uh, you know, spread the word and also you yourself uh, you know, 
to get out of that uh, sewer kind of mentality, you know, because when you see up there, it's constantly about money and about that small entity, you know, as an organization, as a business, as a corporation, and they don't know about the whole world, and uh, I'm nobody, but I can see when you're nobody, you tend to see a little more that I should, uh, yeah, let the uh, scientists and all of them, all of them, the ones who are very, very serious into these businesses and game players and who, what not, you know, and who not who, uh, that we do see when we are at, at a relaxed uh, kind of uh, state of mind uh, that do, uh, uh, is, is anything being done to have a serious policing of the world without hindering the innovations and without you know, hurting the scientists and all that? Because I think it's high time and uh, if we connect with the population explosion and you're talking about the interbreeding and all that stuff and then we have the cannibalism that you know, existed and it's still going on and now we are encouraging those sort of behavior and talking about game and uh, competition, uh, but out there in the scientist, uh, you know, in the scientific f world, uh, I think we should make sure that you know this playground is not for the materialistic minded anymore. And well, by I showing think you've the given example, us a, a lot yeah, to think who about. was supposed to be and the we will discuss it in the during the, the <laughs> reception, which is about to occur. Uh, I want to thank the panelists for a, a great discussion here. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming and participating. Uh, I don't see her here, but I'm going to give a plug for Adele Hunter, who uh, organized, did all of the arrangements, and made it very easy for us. So thank you, and let's enjoy the reception. Thank you. Thank you.